Hi, it's Tim Hagen from Progress Coaching. And one of the things that's going on right now in our industry is that coaching is all the rage. Everybody wants to be a coach or we're asking our managers to coach. Heck, we even want our own bosses to coach us. And those dreaded millennials, oh my gosh, they want coaching and feedback almost every day. So what do we do? What challenges does this present? Quite frankly, I'm gonna use a phrase that might offend some people. It might make you feel a little uneasy. I think we're in an absolute conversation crisis. And let me tell you why I think that. One of the services we provide our clients is a coach the coach service. And the things that we typically get center around, I've got two people who don't work well together. What do I say? What do I do? Or I've got that person near retirement and he doesn't listen. How do I approach that person? Or I've got that person who doesn't take feedback well and every time I bring something up that's tough, she starts to cry. And what do we do? We avoid the conversation. We don't have it. Or we don't know what to say. Or we resort to traditional old school leadership. We just tell them to cut it out or get over it or, geez, if you would just behave better, I'd be a lot happier. The fact of the matter is that we have to learn that coaching is a separate language. It takes time. Let me give you an example. What do we do when we have two people who don't work well together? We bring them together and we say, John, Bob, now the two of you know you've got to work better together, right? And I need you two to buckle up and I need you two to really pull it together. By the way, they hate each other. Do we really think that's going to have long-term sustainable results? Of course not. But what if we could have a conversation in getting them to see the opportunities of working together on their own merits, of their own choice? I'll introduce you to a cool concept called blind boards. So Bob, John, would you two agree, if you both worked more effectively together, you'd probably be happier at work? Now, that's a dumb rhetorical question. Of course they're gonna answer yes. Then here's the next step. What if I told you the two of you could do something of your choice to make the relationship better? Would you be a willing participant? Guess what happens? They never answer yes. They say, well, like what? Almost like, I don't want to be too committed to making things better. And you don't go forward until you get two yeses. Then you say, Bob, I want you to go over to this whiteboard. John, you go over to this whiteboard. And I want you to write down five to eight things that you need from each other. When you're done, I'm going to have you switch whiteboards and then prioritize what you're willing to do in the order of your choosing. So guess what they're doing? They're prioritizing what they're willing to do to make the relationship better. Guess what they pick first? The easy things, which is the design of the activity and the design of the conversation. So ultimately, you can gain momentum. Now, I don't say that to you to show off. I don't say that to you to impress you, but I'm comfortable in that conversation. So let's say we have somebody who's very disruptive in staff meetings and the person keeps saying, yeah, I've been through this. I've been at the company 20 years. You know, I'm just within a couple years of retirement, I'm kind of sick of these meetings. What do you do? You have tremendous risk as a leader because if everybody sees this person not participating, it kind of gives them permission to do the same thing. So a person's leadership is at risk. What do we do? We try to get the emotional buy-in. We talk to them behind the scenes, never in front of the group because that's too uncomfortable. And we say, you know, John, I really need you. I need to count on you. I think you could still learn some stuff. And we go for this thing called emotional buy-in. There is no emotional buy-in. They've already demonstrated they have no buy-in. So what do you do? You leave it to chance. But there's a part of the conversation that's critical. And what we need to do as leaders is become more gifted in conversation. The person said, I'm near retirement. That was the person's weapon. So we had an identical situation like that. And I said to this particular person, I said, well, you know, it's funny you brought up retirement. Do you mind if I kind of ask you a weird set of questions? He said, sure, go ahead. Very resistant, I might add. I said, you're walking out to your car, you're at corporate, everybody at the window's talking about you. Honestly, not making anything up, no BS. What do you want people at the company to say about you? Now, what is he supposed to say? 
Well, I hope they thought I was a jerk and I was resistant the last three years of my employment and I was really disruptive in meetings. No, he's going to say all good things because I'm asking about him. And the gentleman immediately turns and goes, put in a good day's work. I was loyal to my customers. I was a good teammate. I worked hard. I never showed up late. I said, awesome. Can I ask you a question? Will you promise to be honest with me? He said, sure. I said, what are you going to do between today and the day you retire to make sure that's exactly what we say about you? And he stopped. His facial expression changed. I got him thinking differently. See, the goal of coaching isn't to change people. It's to get people to change their thought process, their perspective. But that requires us to become gifted in conversation, in questions, in perspective building. Let me give you another one. I had a call from a number of customers, I'll give you one, where I had a manager call and she started talking about this horrible thing called a millennial. And she was really upset. She said, this guy wants to get promoted. He shows up late and she, you know, he's like 20 some years old, Tim, and he's a millennial. And I almost said, you got to get rid of that guy. You got to shoot him. Do you own a gun? Point being is it's not a disease. Millennials have some awesome attributes, but what we tend to do is label people at the expense of the conversation. So let me give you an example of what I crafted out for this manager. I said, look, don't fight him on the merits that he's exhibiting. Those are certainly not extraordinary attributes, showing up late, you know, certainly being immature in terms of being premature of a, of a promotion. But what you have to do is listen to the things that are being said and craft a conversation so you can gain perspective. So here's what happened. She sat down with him and she said, look, I want to do something kind of different. I'd like to show you something on the whiteboard. And I want to kind of write down on the left side of the whiteboard what I think some of your strengths are. And I'd like to hear from you what you think your strengths are. So they wrote them out. There's about seven or eight items. And then she drew a horizontal line across the whiteboard. And at the end, she put the word promotion. She said, now walk me through your current understanding. So I don't make assumptions because I don't want to be unfair to you. That if you are promoted, what is your understanding of the specific duties you have to perform? The skills required, the behaviors required, the knowledge required. Guess what happened? He couldn't answer the question. So instead of saying, you're not ready, she used questions and conversation to get him to come to his own conclusion. And he said very humbly, boy, I guess I, guess I don't know. And she said, that's awesome. So the reason I wanted to draw this on the whiteboard is so we can draw a diagram to move you in that direction. But while I'm looking at some of your strengths, I'd like to add something to your list of strengths. He said, what's that? She said, showing up on time. Because the person on the far end of the board is going to call me for a reference. And that's exactly what I want to say about you. Now, people who know me know I'm very good at this. I practice it. I teach it. I rehearse it. I role play it. Um, this is really embedded in me. But it goes to the lesson. And that conversations, coaching conversations, take time. They take practice. But if we are not going to practice, we are always going to gravitate to rhetorical management. How many times have we heard this? The sales leader saying, come on, Cindy, your numbers are low. You got to get your numbers up. Like there's a revelation in that statement. Or how about the person with the bad attitude? You got to cut it out or else. Or the two people who don't work well together. If you two would just get along better, we'd all be happier. As if these short-term statements have long-term value. I always love the, the statement people make towards people with bad attitudes. They tell them to cut it out or else. Those people have been practicing that crappy attitude for 10 years. What makes us think showing up with one conversation and one mandate, it's actually going to work? So we're in a dilemma. We don't listen as much anymore. We have people who text while we talk to them. We're stimulated by social media. We've got this thing called a phone. We have apps popping up in messages almost daily and hourly. And so we're distracted. But that challenges us as a leadership community to do what? 
to be spot on, know the questions, know the framework, know the progressions that we can take with people so we can maximize their performance. So let me know your thoughts below this video. What do you think are some of the challenges with conversation? What do you think are some of the challenges associated with having conversation? What do you think are some of the challenges getting managers and leaders to adopt the language of coaching? Thanks for your time.